Uh, thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, our uh, first item is uh, item 4.01, the superintendent's uh, honor roll, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Dustin Barnes, for our first recognition. Recognition will go to uh, Angie Halstein, who's created by Steve School at Park Elementary. Austin writes, truly a boon to boon, a boon to boon park. Mentoring new staff members to students, student teachers to creating relationships, parents and families, cost impact our society, whatever it takes. Over the years, multiple Student teachers have benefited from the experience and training. Afterwards, these teachers reached out to share how much they learned from Austin. This school year, Austin has worked with two new SPED teachers as well, who has helped them have as many opportunities as possible to grow and develop. Further, Ms. Austin develops relationships with parents and families, helping them connect services and bridging needs. We are so thankful. President, members of the board, next two with some very, very, very special recognition. As our Class 6A boys basketball championship makes their way in, just want to share some, some of their. It uh, says the 6A boys basketball trophy is right where it belongs, back here in North Little Rock. Wait. <laughs> a loud. Next slide. The 6A Boys Basketball Trophy is right where it belongs, back here in North Little Rock. For Coach Johnny Rice, Wes Ballon, and Nathan Claiborne, this is the fifth state title in six tries in their nine years as with the program. The, the Charging Wildcats completed the season with 21 wins and two losses. The losses came at the hands of our crosstown rival, Little Rock Central. Both of these conference games were pretty fierce, and as a fan, you were sweating. But the third time is the charm, right? In Hot Springs, where our Charging Wildcats put the bow on the season, beat Little Rock, season, Little Rock Central 65-65, to and brought home the hardware. In the post-game remarks, Coach Rice called this victory the biggest program win North Little Rock has ever had. He said the following, 
These are guys that have been here, stayed here, and wanted to be here. They bought into they bought in their into their role, played hard, and didn't care who did what. Here are some of the individual honors received. Senior DJ Smith, 6A Central, All Conference, All State, and All Tournament. Senior Tracy Steele, 6A Central, All Conference, 6A State, All Tournament. And junior Kalel Ware, 6A Central, All All Conference. 6A All-State, 6A State Final. The team is made up of the following. Jaden, Jaden Smith, Tracy Steele, DJ Smith, Cole Mary, Kareem Cotton, Khalil Ware, Ubong Edom, Felix Wade, Josh Evans, Mario Frazier, Reed Miller, Ty Davis, Keelan Jackson, Allen, head coach Johnny Rice, assistant coach Nathan Claiborne, Wes Brown, West 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 Ballon and went to high school. And Jim Echo. Congratulations. <laughs> Would any of you like to say something?
ball here. We might as well just win. Now let's recognize our cheerleaders. North Little Rock Cheer is blessed to be able to cheer on some of the best teams in the state. This squad does not take for granted that its cheer season lasts longer than most other cheer teams as they get to cheer for our teams that make it to state championship games. COVID kept the squad from cheering at away basketball games this year, and, uh, and quarantine kept, two, kept them from two football playoff games, but the girls were still watching on live stream. They genuinely love NLR and its sports teams. Another side that many don't see is the competitive team. This is the sanctioned sport through AAA. These girls practice as much as they can, as long as they can, as they can secure a gym space during the week, working around all other sports. They perform a high-energy, two-minute, 30-second routine and get one shot to make it perfect. Unlike other sports, they don't have a halftime to regroup and get a new game plan. The, there aren't two halves to work through or 18 holes to fix mistakes. They get only one shot. They have chased a state title for the last eight years and have come so very close several times. A sixth place finish in the very first year, four third place finishes, and two runners up titles. However, this was their year. For the first time, NLR cheer can be called 6A All Girl State Champion. Despite injuries, a global pandemic with its quarantines and close contacts, these young ladies came out on top. They performed a routine at state with zero deductions, meaning no mistakes, and they beat the second place team by more than nine points. The team is made up of the following. Madison Alford, Savannah Bjork, Corbin Colley, Abrielle Crump, Julia French, Harlan Hogan, Revel, Revel, Revel Hogan, Caroline Jolly, Mia Jones, Amaya Kendall, Taya Tia, Taya Green, Tara Newton, Marisol Sella, Carrie Smith, Olivia Stuckey, Anna Baggett, McKenna Kism, Chisholm, okay, Jaden Cook, McKenna Crump, El Emma Dill, Leah Edwards, Abby Schaefer, and Madison Shaw. And Mrs. Sella serves as their coach. Would any of you like to say something, especially a senior? <laughs> I just want to say that I'm really proud of this team. The amount of stuff we've accomplished that people don't even see throughout the year with getting quarantined in a bubble and missing schoolwork and having to fight through that, the 6 a.m. practices that literally make you want to throw up at the end of them. Just every challenge that we've accomplished and, like, how close we are as a team, I'm really proud of that. <laughs> um, I'm really proud that, like, we fought so hard for this, and, like, this has been a goal that we've had for so many years now, and I'm so proud of each individual, especially, like, the people who came onto the team this year and, like, really struggled and, like, fought to keep up with everyone that's been here. The skills that we've gained this year is, like, really amazing, and we've done everything that we could expect to do and better. I mean, we, this team together has had a sixth-place title at Nationals, and we have come really close to state and even won state this year, so I'm really proud of all the hard work that each of us have done.
Congratulations. Following the death of a classmate, some sophomores at North Little Rock High School began producing a series called Let's Talk Wildcat. The series, which can be viewed on the YouTube channel NLR TV, is a show that allows students to discuss issues about the stresses of high school, like workload, friendships, relationships, mental health, and anxiety. The cast members say they want their peers to know that while adults may not always know what teens are going through, this show will be the outlet where they can, where everyone can relate with one another and help one another get through some of life's challenges. We have some of the members of that round table here tonight. Corey Edwards will give us insight as to what they plan to do in their mission. Hello everyone, my name is Corey Edwards. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Let's Talk Wildcast is just a way for us to express ourselves after a really really hard year. Being in high school, you come and you expect to still be friends with people, still laugh, talk to people. And it's really hard, especially when it comes to a lot of work and sometimes you start a job. You know, it gets hard out here. Develop in mind, trying to figure out who we are. I know personally this year was really hard and I just want to be able to express myself. So that's how we started with. Hope you guys can watch it it out, see how it is. Madam President, members of the board, uh, recognition 4.3 is our parent North Star by Ms. Walker. You know, she always does a great job of keeping everyone in suspense through this month's North Star recognition. President Temple, 
board members, Dr. Paluski, Dr. McGee in his absence, North Little Rock staff, community, it is my honor and pleasure to present April 21 Parent North Star. Mr. Adam Keithley and his wife, Kendall, are parents in the North Little Rock School District. Mr. and Mrs. Keithley have a beautiful daughter, Piper, who's a first grade student at Crestwood Elementary. Mr. Keithley reached out to his daughter's school nurse at Crestwood, seeking to assist with getting the Crestwood staff vaccinated for COVID-19. Mr. Keithley could tr truly adhere to this because he is the owner of Cornerstone Pharmacy in Jacksonville, Arkansas. This seemingly small gesture turned into a district-wide vaccination. After meeting with members of North Little Rock School District leadership, Dr. Paluski, Dr. McGee, Nurse Tanya Green, and Leanne Alexander via a conference call, Mr. Keeley was asked if he could and would help vaccinate all North Little Rock School District staff. Mr. Keithley, without hesitation, said yes and began to coordinate with another pharmacist located in Rose City. After that, the North Little Rock School District vaccination journey began. The plan of action was set and we were ready to go. Week one, staff consent forms were completed and turned in, but guess what? The clinic only received 100 vaccines, only allowing the first group of staff to receive the first vaccine. Week two, the pharmacy only received 100 vaccines, which pushed the schedule out another week. Week three, no vaccines were received. Week four, no vaccine. Then Mother Nature sends a major snowstorm, which brought everything and everybody to a halt. However, prior to the storm, Adam and his wife, Kendall, alongside nurses, administered the vaccine of some staff members one afternoon before the storm. After seven days of inclement weather, Adam and Kendall continue with vaccinations and to date, over 600 North Little Rock staff members are vaccinated. Any person that requested the vaccination received it. North Little Rock School District also received support from the Baptist Health North Little Rock Clinic with 253 vaccinations. Adam and Kendall Keithley went to every campus and central office to administer vaccinations to make it convenient to teachers and staff ensuring that they would cause no class disruptions. To say they've gone above and beyond is an understatement. However, Adam and Kendall represent the acronyms of the Parent North Star, supporting teachers achieving results. They've been working with Northern Rock School District for over two months, which what we thought would only be two weeks. Adam and Kendall were nominated for this recognition by Leanne Alexander and Nurse Tanya Green knowing that without their willingness, patience, and dedication, we would not have been able to get our staff vaccinated for COVID-19. Dr. Paluski, board members, staff, and community, help me congratulate April 21, Parent North Star, Adam and Kendall Keithley. And Mr. Keithley thought he was here to answer questions about the vaccination. And I'm so excited because you're the first parents that I get to personally hand this to because of COVID-19. Thank you. Would you like to say something?
doing it today instead of the game, which six place came in. First place in his day 2020 conference rich face set quarter third place. Second place winner is a fifteen hundred bonus choice gift card for the district. The third place winner being a thousand dollar donor gift card. Well, third place at eighteen thousand five five points. Second place at thirty one thousand points. The first place today <laughs> had thirty five thousand seven hundred two points. So we have won a twenty two annual conference day mix. with conference in the chamber lunch. Um, as far as wait school is so um, we had a meeting out there Monday. You got to tell about all them games this week. Well, I went to <laughs> certainly all of them, but I also um, was a speaker at uh, 7th Street. As a matter of fact, I spoke twice. Storm hit during one of those, so I had to come back and, and redo it. And also um, at the Academy. I do have a question, uh, Ms. West. Uh, it, would there be an opportunity for the district maybe to purchase land across the um, That's still kind of the main problem there. Uh, possibly. Thank you. And it's one of those that's so
five point two. Yes, I'll I'll be uh, very brief. March seventh was Sunday. It was very significant. Little Rock uh, to host uh, Dr. Richard Deere, who's the superintendent of Godly ISD. Uh, they're modeling their for Little Rock, and so they wanted to come with this engineer to host them. Mr. Hatch, I want to recognize him. He he did a great job. He did time. Uh, on uh, March 29th and 25th, uh, I, the teacher focus group. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, later in my 100. And uh, on March 31st, Dr. McGee, our assistant, and myself, attend the Seventh Street Community Forum. Uh, March 31st, um, another recognition at uh, Glendale. I had the opportunity to read to some. Always fun every time I get to the class. Uh, April 1st was a day that uh, Ms. Kemple, we had visited North Little Rock. Academy, as well as their transportation office, but that was great. Um, on April first, uh, Vanilla basketball team uh, was recognized uh, as a state captain. They were recognized by both the House and the Senate. Mr. was there as well to represent the Board of Education, and they got to meet the governor. And I got to meet the governor. It was great to be recognized. Rock crowd. Uh, on the second, I joined the North. Chamber. I learned a lot about Dickinson Stadium and escaping. Starting to emerge the fifth uh, and sixth, uh, put a North Little Rock uh, High School on. Uh, on the seventh, North Little Rock breakfast meeting with the mayor. Uh, I know this was started with Dr. Lee, but each month, uh, myself, I have a breakfast meeting with the mayor, um, the staff, Chief Cashin, Mr. Owens of the Little Rock Chamber. And it's a it's a great opportunity to collaborate. We meet once, talk about you know issues, what's going on, and concerns. So I really applaud the mayor and his leadership in that, and it allows open communication. Really appreciate. It. Um, I visited on the eighth Pike Elementary uh, Childhood Center. Time to get to be with kids, especially those little kids, is always exciting to me. Uh, on the ninth, I had the opportunity uh, to tour Blast County Special School, Dr. McNulty. He is introduced into the area. We got to visit some of his schools. I'm greatly appreciative of that. On the 9th, uh, Dr. McKee and I attended the Academy's regional meeting as we begin to think about business partnership. Uh, on the 12th, with Ms. West, we did attend the Amboy Community Center. Great. Uh, on the 14th, I met with Nick. No, I'm going to. Nick Reed. Learn about our heart. What's going on in the community? I was very proud of that. Yesterday, I was in Mr. Wisnock, Mr. Wisnock, yes. um, <laughs> in the East program. Is he passionate about that? I had a great opportunity to spend some time with him and then attended. No, Madam President, I checked with Mr. Uh, Smith, 6.1 community, there's no report. Thank you, PC. Yes, I'm going to turn over to Mr. Brown. Our information item is synergistic, two year energy conservation program update. They have a very brief uh, presentation and uh, also. I'm good. I'm good. How's that? All right, Dr. Belusky, uh, members of the board, thanks for having us. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we partnered with uh, North Little Rock School District uh, back in October of 2018. And um, what we did, you know, you guys already have some sustainability inside uh, your district, uh, but we came in to support that and do something that's deeper and comprehensive to try to reduce your utility spend. I'm going to ask Brian if he can move forward. And before I move on, I have with me uh, Doug Bilyeu, uh, Vice President of the company. And back here behind him 
This is your in-house energy specialist, Robert Glover, who's been with the district. I think he's employed 34 years prior to, um, he actually works for us, but he's embedded here in North Little Rock. So here's some of the things that we do. We look for cost savings via reduced utility spend, um, optimized building and comfort systems, and culture of sustainability uh, created within your organization. Um, so here's some of the stats. We're 27 months into the program, and uh, we're real excited to be here tonight to report that the savings from, from this energy program is $1,134,000. Uh, since the beginning, it's incredible. It really is a big benchmark. I'm happy to have that number in front of us tonight. 40% um, reduction in energy use, uh, the EUI. And what that means is we take a measure. It's a standard type of measurement for the type of work that we do. You take the natural gas usage, electricity usage. Um, it blends into a KBTU a unit and then divided by your square footage. And overall, since the beginning of the program, the reduction in raw use is 40%. So think about what that would have been beforehand to reduce that by 40 percent. It's really incredible. So, um, and I'll get into this, but it's it, we can't do it alone. It takes everybody. Um, savings of that 40 percent reduction is about 25 percent. Um, Brian. Thank you. Energy use intensity. Again, we started with a 42 EUI here in North Little Rock at the uh, October of 2018 and currently at about a 25. Um, so your regional average, that's going to be a TOLA area. So um, Texas, Arkansas, uh, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, uh, the regional average there is about a 50 EUI. And so you guys started at a 42, so better than the region already. Um, and your neighboring clients, there's going to be four other clients in Arkansas are at a 38, and you guys are at a 25. So. I just wanted to put that comparison so you can understand when I talk EUI, because that might be a little bit foreign, where you stand against other neighboring school districts in your region. Um, it's a big accomplishment, again, 40%. The environmental impact um, is a, the reduction is equivalent to um, emissions, reduced emissions from cars driven, 18,406 uh, miles driven from a car. Um, 125,000 um, trees grown, the carbon sequestered from trees grown for 10 years, um, and you have greenhouse gases there. And something else that really came out of this program that was really cool, and this was kind of announced um, a few months back, uh, we work with the EPA. Um, you can hire an outside engineering firm to work with the EPA to come in and do a lot of um, testing at your schools. They come in and test uh, CO2 lighting, et cetera. It's pretty comprehensive. There's a lot of information that goes into this. We feed this information into a database that's been collected by the EPA of schools uh, or buildings of similar like across the country. And 12 of your buildings qualified to be at Energy Star certified buildings, um, which means you're in the upper 25 percentile of all buildings of the like. So that's a great accomplishment. Again, those are campuses. So um, happy to see that number, and that's, again, a result of everybody coming together and working towards that goal. Um, here's a list of the buildings uh, that receive the Energy Star uh, building certifications. Um, happy to say that all those are on there. I will note that there was one building that is not on the list, um, Meadow Park. Get that right, that Robert? Yeah, Mo Meadow Park. And the data that we supplied the EPA they came back with some questions about some of the data. It's, yeah, again, crazy how many computers, um, how many teachers, how much parking lot space, how many lights, external, internal, et cetera. And when we got that information back to them, we actually missed a time frame there because we were in COVID, which was unoccupied. So it didn't qualify, unfortunately. Doesn't mean the building doesn't perform similar to its peers. So we have a goal to make sure that when we come back around to Energy Star, the EPA, to do this again next year, that we'll capture all of them. Um, that doesn't come easy. We'll have to keep working hard at it. So again, Robert Glover, um, the fact that he's been in the district 34 years is a really big, um, it's a really big deal. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that know him. They see him. They, they now know him as the energy czar, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, but what we really like to do is go out to the buildings when they're unoccupied, right? That's when we try to, we need to master that. We want to optimize when the buildings are running, but master the unoccupied. Um, and Robert has conducted 3,231 building audits 
Um, so when everybody goes home, three o'clock, four o'clock, some of you six o'clock, seven o'clock, teachers that stay late. But uh, Robert's out there in the buildings. You might see him out there if you're out there late. He's going to be at events, checking on comfort, um, checking to make sure when is that event over, uh, because we want to shut things down, set it back, and get that equipment turned off, lighting, HVAC, et cetera, to find that savings. In 2020 alone, uh, those audits generated 731 faults and 109 alerts. And what that means is through our software, he's generating a fault, meaning I found a thing that's outside of the guidance. So if he walks in here and the air conditioner is running at night or during spring break, that's a fault. We have to find out how can we get to the bottom of that and make sure that that thing's not running outside the parameters. Um, and the alerts mean it's a follow-up. It has to be followed up. Um, continuing success, here's some of the things that we have to do. Continue to develop an energy conservation culture. Um, strategically plan. Uh, there's a big percentage of the savings that's captured during breaks. Um, communicate the program, and you guys have done a really great job of that. Getting hold of uh, media and Dustin have really been supportive um, in that. Um, obviously, save to reinvest dollars through what matters most, and uh, celebrate the Energy Star building certifications, which we're going to do that at a principals meeting, and then take that to the campus level and and uh, celebrate that. And there's a uh, there's a plaque that they'll have as well. And the sticker that you're familiar with, the Energy Star thing that's on your refrigerator or whatever, we'll also have a decal to put on the front door. We don't supply that. That comes directly from the EPA. Any one more? And I think this is the last slide. So, again, I've talked about Robert, and we can't do it without Robert, but it goes way deeper than that. Uh, we have to have support from the board. We have to have support from the superintendent because every, you know, it has to be top down. And Brian has been instrumental in driving that. You know, when we run into challenges or what's next, what else, um, Brian's always open to that. Uh, working with Harold Hatch and Andy Anderson, uh, the M and O departments, your grounds crews, the irrigation, et cetera. It takes everybody. Um, so I just want to say thanks to everybody for this. Um, it's a big congratulations to the district wide. We come in to support what you're already doing, um, and so thank you for the opportunity to uh, to really drive this thing. And you guys are. You guys have set a standard to be best in class. I'm not just blowing smoke at you at the meeting here. You really are. Uh, you really are uh, best in class with the clients that I oversee. Question. Yes, ma'am. Robert, would you step in a fight? That kind of technology for you all, artists. Time. How, what, I mean, I need to explain it. Great. A green X auditing. And that just gives us the opportunity to go in and open up an audit and start an audit. And we can write down fault. Alert, and we can send those to the building principal or, or whoever we might deem that needs to do the handling of the audit. Another question. Yeah. Oh, and then if the uh, file audit. or uh, repairs or whatever that needs to be handled as soon as possible. Now, explaining about what Yes, ma'am. Well, what happened is when, the, when they came in and we gathered all the information and data for the EPA, that information was sent to them, and they sent back uh, things on different buildings that needed to have questions answered or, you know, data gathered uh, for them to have the qualifications. And by the time that they sent the uh, information back to us about Middle Park, that's when the COVID uh, started. And some of the numbers that we sent back made us not qualified or maybe it didn't get back to them in time for Metal Park to become certified because of the COVID, yeah. Ma'am, question. Yes, ma'am. 
I never knew you would grow up to be a czar. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, how did COVID actually impact what you're presenting today? What kind of impact do you anticipate when we bring most of the students back to the building? It's a great question because there, there is a difference in the use of, of some of your facilities uh, depending on occupancy, uh, depending on the number of events and things like that that are scheduled. Um, and so it's really been, um, well, everybody's been COVIDed, right? So there's an impact of the way every business operates, and this has impacted us just the same. So we have a measurement and verification team um, and some engineers with some proprietary software called Simulate. And what they do is we, we have to have Robert pull the data from district uh, information for enrollment um, and what the occupancy is of the building. We compare that to what the base year information would have been or how we're comparing to. And, uh, and the engineers look at that. They ad adjust the occupancy down, which basically it's, a, it's an engineering way to establish how do we measure what the building should do with this reduced occupancy compared to what it would normally do when there's full occupancy. And so um, we have to do that with, this has been something, you know, that, that it goes way beyond Little Rock, but it's been a bin big burden, and it's something that's really important to us to make sure that when we measure the data compared to the base year, that it's accurate, you know, that it is accurate. And so um, it's, been, it's been a challenge, you know, right. but, uh, but uh, I can assure you that it's accurate, and we are very busy and on top of that, yeah. Yeah. I want any other questions? All of it. Okay. Sorry. So during the summer, we and yeah. then the twelve. With that said, what kind of saving time are we? Sure. That's a that's a good question, and for us, for what we do, I don't want to say it's a concern because you have to operate the way you have to operate, right? And unfortunately, across the country, given the distance learning, um, the, the well, for me, I would have a challenge learning the same as I would if I were in the classroom. So we recognize that there's going to be a lot more in-classroom learning in the summer than there would have been in the past. Um, and so in that, what we have to do is Robert has to be diligent to get out there at the sites where we're going to have students learning, find out what's the best areas to keep them in, you know, and how many students can be in a classroom, how many teachers are going to be in that classroom, Try to consolidate as best as we possibly can, keep them in a certain end of the building or certain parts of the building that are more efficient. Um, you know, if I had my way, we'd probably move everybody into the high school and run different towers for different age groups, but I recognize that that's not a possibility. But we bring recommendations to, uh, <laughs> to you, um, to uh, building administrators, on how can we most efficiently do what you need to do to educate, you know, your students. And so we work with what you're doing. We just want to bring recommendations on how can we how can we do this best for the learning environment first and put comfort first and then how do we find out how to keep the most money in house we possibly can instead of send it to the utility. Are we? Yeah, yeah. I want to introduce Doug Billu, uh, vice president, of company. No, and, and, and real quick, I just want to bounce off of what Wayne had, had presented and, and just say synergistic with our partners, we want to be seen as more than a third-party vendor. We want to be seen as a member of the team. And North Little Rock School District has allowed us to be a part of that team because everyone has worked really well together. It's teamwork. You know the importance from the board to leadership, teachers. You know what's important about making sure you're being good stewards of your natural resources, your financial resources. For that, we also wanted to be able to award you with the Synergistic Energy Excellence Award for all the hard work that's been done over the last two years and looking forward to even more great things done uh, moving forward. And again, like Wayne said, we couldn't do it without, without all of your cooperation. We appreciate you so much.
Yes, item? sir. So item uh, 7.2 in, in uh, members of the public board of education. This was a follow-up item from our February uh, retreat regarding the superintendent's evaluation uh, process and procedures. And, uh, I know he doesn't need any any introduction, but our chief legal counsel uh, for North Little Rock School District, uh, Mr. Jay Beck. Thank you, Dr. Pulaski. Dr. Pulaski asked me to address the board briefly tonight on the superintendent's evaluation process and the procedures you follow in that. It's really a pretty simple process. The key is just to have a process. Once we agree on a process, we implement that process rigor and it's a very make it a very robust process. I want to go to your policy two three. That's that's a logical starting place. That's the policy for the evaluation of the superintendent. The policy requires and basically a two part policy one requires you to have to adopt a process by which you evaluate the superintendent. And then it sets out a series of goals, five goals or objectives that the evaluation process is supposed to accomplish it's implemented. The first goal is probably the key one. It's to consider the relationship maintained between the superintendent and a robust, rigorous evaluation process, for me, is the best way for that relationship between uh, the board be developed by that I'm talking about authentic robust rigorous evaluation now I've seen you know my 30 years of I've seen many many different kinds of evaluation processes and procedures used by districts some are quite simple some are much more detailed and evolved uh, I know Dr. Paluski has some good ideas. We talked about his ideas, what that process is like. I would always, you know, there are lots of resources, uh, you know, uh, publicly available on the Internet. I think the ASBA also has an outstanding evaluation process. I have worked with Dr. Ann Butcher, the ASBA, a couple of years ago. as She developed a real comprehensive process. Her, her uh, what she has made available is found on the ASPA website. It's got follow. It has forms you use, individual board member evaluations, the, the growth plan process, develop goals for the superintendent and his growth plan. Uh, also has the form for the summative evaluation where the individual synthesized to final uh, evaluation. It talks about the process, you know, the short that we develop preliminary goals and objectives, preliminary growth plan for the superintendent collaboratively, then the board adopts a final plan. Uh, we gather evidence throughout the year. Mid-year we have a kind of a mid summation or summary of what's happened. And then at the end of the year, we do individual board member evaluation, which is the president's summative evaluation based on body evidence received from the individual board member evaluation. So that's the process. I mean, the website at the ASBA has rubric as a rubric or a annual summative evaluation as sample questions to guide board member and superintendent communication during executive session to kind of guide the process and help you gather information from the super guide uh, so that's that's the basic process it's not you know, I'm a believer in kiss keep it simple stupid okay and and that is the way it should be done just keep it simple have a simple process but the key is to make that process. So I stand available to answer any questions you have about either the process or what you want to do and how I can help you implement uh, the system in a way that's really effective. 
why do we change it? I've heard this presentation now several times about creating an evaluation tool. Why does the tool change? Changes, then how can you properly uh, evaluate a superintendent? One, against themselves, and two, against other superintendents. You know, that's a great question. I'm not usually privy on most cases super evaluation because I only get consulted. I get that call from the board president saying, Houston, we've got a problem. Uh, and that's what I start to see. And ordinarily, you know, when things are going well, I, that's when I see that's, that's when the process is working. You know, when things are going well and the superintendent and the board are on the same page as far as growth, progress being made on achieving those objectives. I, I agree with you. I don't think the process should be changed if we have a good process. Uh, it's not real clear to me what process we followed here in the past. So maybe some self-examination, you know, in looking at the process we've used in the past, compare it to the ideas that Dr. Kaluski has to what Dr. Butcher developed for the ASPA website, and then turn that into our system that we're going to, you know, use Pete. Because, you know, year-to-year -year comparisons are best done when you I have a question, just clarity, I guess. Yes, At the workshop that we had, I thought we had came up with process, and it was a matter of dates of when we were supposed to, when stuff was due. I think that's right. I mean, that's a question. That one of the things, and we went, that's not one of the things on there is in December evaluated that I think that was the that's question what, that's what it because was because on ASPA and I think there's some renewal of the superintendent contract in February so I think that was where the is there a summative evaluation do the superintendent summative evaluation around 30 days prior board meeting where we consider renewal of the contract, okay, possibly for another year. So that would be June. No, that would be, it's May. typically in January yeah. or February yeah. when we when we consider the super. I can't remember if it's January or February in North Little Rock. Okay, okay. so then yeah. generally January. the uh, the evaluation is going to be Month before that, or December, because that's that's kind of the calculus. We look at the evaluation to inform our decision on renewal of the contract. I remember, and so what the issue was was because he came in November, right. and out of fairness, it was difficult to try to. That wasn't going to be even his hundred first hundred days, I, I and get so your that's why now. it was. We yes, were toying yes. back and forth as to when it needed to be done. So, so I think my sense, thinking about it, you know, right now for the first time, my sense would be that our evaluation process now, and here in a couple of months, mid year, we have a review, and then next December is when we evaluate Dr. That way we kind of get it on track because if we start late, like July 1, which there. We have four board members that were elected. And uh, there it admits that uh, we don't know who's going to run the task. We have, if there's a change in anything, uh, would it be a privilege for a new person to still try and evaluate? I think it would be very difficult. 
said the election's going to be it's well, in November. If the election's in November. Mm-hmm. I think it would be well nigh impossible for a board member to evaluate. You have two board members coming on in December. They haven't even had board training, new board member training. Yet, just got, they don't have relation. They haven't been able to serve. Have any experience like evidence you would want to collect? I would want evidence, and well, I've been watching and I've been doing for being fair and there's a revolution. Board needs to put in place to say if a new member is on board, you do not have a signature trying to evaluate the contenders. I don't know if we have a policy in our board government on that. That's something we need to consider. That's also a good point. I think I think what happens there is summative evaluation based on board president's view of the individual board member evaluation. To basically Develop that summative evaluation based on the individual evaluation of board members who have been there the entire year. Okay. Because board members. Because we would have a new president in November. Correct. That is going Mm -hmm. around. Uh, So, there. The reason I say that our board is always nice, right? Automatic. Well, and and the point here is, we final summit occurs December. Okay, but that evaluation is the product of all the individual board member evaluation that are based on data, observation, evidence that is collected throughout. Okay, so uh, e- even if we have board members that are not reelected or don't choose to run again, they can complete evaluation before they go off the board okay, and submit those to the board president so that we have, you know, individual evaluations that are based on evaluations by board members that had the opportunity to observe, collect data, uh, when do you think start? Immediately. <laughs> and uh, how starts market house? He said three weeks or whatever. Okay. Or mm-hmm. like that's the most. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Cleaver. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you all very much, and as always, feel free to reach out privately if you have a question later. We can call you. How much you call? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Miss Williams, it's always about the money. It's always about the money. Uh, we've got the money. One, two twenty-five an hour. That's pretty good. You've been here for two hours. <laughs> Senator Steele, congratulations <laughs> to you. Thank you. He had a real nice guest. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, Thank his son you. had to correct about his name. He's <laughs> Steele Jr., not Tracy Steele.
You know, I was wondering what this. I'm sorry. I was Doctor. wondering what this. I thought it might be easier. See this. Well, good evening, uh, Madam President, uh, members of our Board of Education. Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Kaluski, uh, the very proud, the new, the proud superintendent of the North Little Rock School District. And first, just let me uh, say how happy I am to be here. Uh, I am honored to be selected by this Board of Education uh, to be the superintendent of schools. And uh, I could not be more proud uh, to call North Little Rock home in such a short time. And everybody has been welcoming to myself, uh, and to my wife, and we've been overwhelmed with Southern hospitality. As promised, uh, when I entered, uh, began the process of talking about the superintendent's 100-day uh, transition plan summary report. And I know that uh, many Board of Education members have been anxious to, uh, for me to present on my first 100 days. Let me first also say that uh, my first 100 days was around February. Uh, for, so the public knows. And uh, the reason that we're doing this in April and not February is that I asked the Board of Education members for an extension, specifically so I could meet with small groups of teachers at every one of our campuses. I'm proud to say I've done that. I've spe uh, spoken with just about over 160 of our classroom teachers uh, across our entire school district. So that is the why, the, the reasoning why this isn't in, hasn't been done in February and it's in. So I'm excited. So the purpose of the presentation uh, is to inform our Board of Education and to inform our community, our parents, our employees, uh, on the superintendent's 100-day transition plan, which is really my summer report uh, as a new superintendent really entering uh, into the North Little Rock School District. So with that, there are three phases of the superintendent's really entry plan. So there's phase one, which is uh, pre-entry, second phase, entry, and then the summary report. So on the timeline, uh, and I was very fortunate and blessed by our Board of Education to allow me uh, the opportunity to have 20 days uh, prior to starting the responsibility of superintendent on November the 1st. Uh, so as my wife came and I came uh, in September, right after Labor Day, so really in September and October really allowed me to jumpstart this process. And that's where I began the interview process of meeting with key stakeholders. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And uh, begin meeting and really touring facilities. So phase two starts, uh, and that started on uh, November the 1st, where I took on full responsibility as superintendent of the North Little Rock School District. And that really has taken us up to this moment in time today. And that was really around continuing the process of interviewing, listening, learning. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. Uh, we did in February, February 6th, I believe, we did have our first Board of Education uh, retreat held here in, in the Board of Education for social distancing, and uh, which was great. And I think it was great to begin to develop that relationship together uh, and think about some professional development as we move forward. And that really brings us to today, which is uh, phase three, uh, referred to as the summer report. And uh, that's really chunked into three components uh, where I'm going to spend some time and uh, I would ask Dr. McGee, our assistant superintendent, was going to co-present uh, co with me on some data, but he did have a family uh, obligation. He may have the opportunity to be back. Uh, but we're first going to talk about the data story and really uh, uncover what is our data story here in North Little Rock. And then after all this time, uh, what are some key themes 
that have emerged, some major findings, and then what are we going to do about it? What are our next steps? And then how do the next steps really inform, very timely after Mr. Beckett was here, the goals part of the evaluation process, uh, which will take place next. So with that said, the purpose of executive onboarding is, is simply that, a new leader to enter an organization as very fast as possible, establish as many relationships, strong relationships as possible, and, and really listen. Spend the time to listening multiple stakeholders and really learn about the current state of the organization uh, because leaders are hired uh, to make improvements. Leaders, and in order to make improvements, you have to know which are the right improvements to make. And by spending that time establishing trust and relationships allows this immersion uh, of a lot of data and a lot of information. So I had the opportunity to, uh, and I'm not going to go down through this list, but uh, really interview, and I feel very confident in uh, the, the six themes that I'll be presenting, uh, that I had a great opportunity to interview and talk with many different stakeholders from all interviewing all of our uh, board members, our past board members when I got hired, our current board members, proud to say over 160 classroom teachers, uh, parents, community groups, uh, institutions of higher education, uh, just a, a conglomerate, if you will, of just lots of different people that, that have a vested interest in the North Little Rock School District. So one is to start with telling the, the North Little Rock School District, and there's a lot of data here and I, and, and I recognize that, and I'm really going to hit the highlights uh, in order we get to uh, the, the key findings. First of all, I am very proud to be a part of this community. I said that once, I say it again, and I'll say it a million times. Uh, I've only been here just less than six months, and I equally have the same passion that you're going to hear me talk about that our community has for our school district. Our school district. And number one is you just can't hide that charging wildcat slide. And you know, when I think about and I talk to other individuals across the state and across our community, in fact, I was at a recent uh, superintendent's meeting and he said, oh, you're the new superintendent from, uh, from North Little Rock. He's like, oh, he's like the prestige of Old Main, the prestige of North Little Rock. And that's why I put this up here uh, is the historic uh, North Little Rock 6, September 9th, uh, 1957. That is our roots. It is a pillar of the civil rights movement. And that is our heritage. And that is... Uh, means so much to this community and means so much to me. And I think you're going to see very quickly what it means to the entire school district. So here is just a, a brief map of our school zones, our attendance areas. Uh, but this shows all of our campuses, 15 campuses. So we do have an early childhood center. We have nine elementary schools, uh, two middle schools, really one middle school, but it's broken up, as you know, into two campuses. Our uh, high school campus, our center of excellence, which is within that. And then we have our alternative program, which is the North uh, Little Rock Academy. And uh, as, we, as I've heard, you know, North Little Rock being landlocked, but I will tell you one of the things, and it's important to recognize here, which is the, the economics uh, of this area of central Arkansas that I've learned very, very quickly. There's a lot of economic growth uh, that is not only right here in North Little Rock, but around us. And we'll talk about that later. I think it's an exciting time to be in North Little Rock and in central Arkansas. Uh, as there's more economic growth is to come, and we'll see how that plays out later in order to provide a high-quality workforce for our community. Strengths. So there are so many strengths, and there are so many things about North Little Rock uh, to be proud of. And number one is the sense of pride and tradition. Uh, I heard over and over and over again the sense of pride of this community. People grow up here. Uh, people may move away, but they choose to come back. Uh, many people would tell me, Dr. P, this is home. And as a result of that, uh, there are many people that work for the North Little Rock School District, uh, our employees that are products of the North Little Rock School District. That is a lot to be proud of. There's a lot of passion here. Uh, you heard me talk about that in my interview. Uh, you heard me talk about the passion that people have for North Little Rock. And uh, we have brand recognition. Uh, we have brand recognition throughout the entire state of Arkansas. Uh, the NLR, I don't know the history of that, how that came about, uh, but I was speaking with someone at the superintendent's conference, and they were talking about, wow, you have such brand recognition. I remember meeting somebody uh, up in northwest Arkansas, and they had the NLR, and they said, what are you doing all the way up here? So we have brand recognition. I think that is a lot to be proud of as it relates to our marketing. One of our biggest strengths is our diversity. Uh, the diversity of our community is one of our greatest strengths. I've heard that over and over again, uh, and that is just a 
kind of a microcosm of the world. And it's so great that kids and children and families grow up in such a, dus- a, a diverse environment because you, you learn so much. You're a better person because of growing up in a diverse community. Uh, I've heard this time and time again. We're a large school district with a hometown feel. Uh, you know, hearing about Friday nights and football and basketball games, there's a lot of community pride. It's strong, dedicated, supportive stakeholders, businesses, the North Little Rock Chamber, our business partnerships, uh, the PTA, the alumni. Wow. Uh, it is just overflowing. Uh, we have award-winning facilities. If it was one of the things I've seen for myself or I've heard, uh, which has lived up uh, to the current vision about world-class schools for world-class students, uh, we do have uh, top-rate facilities. I think that's a lot to be proud of. I talked about the dedication. We do have a comprehensive curricular program. Uh, I think one of the things that's been impressive to me as a strength is how this community and this school district has tr- transitioned to COVID-19. Uh, it is sh- purely short of amazing. And I think that's a lot of this entire community, but also our employees. Our North Little Rock High School, our, our career academy programs, the Ford NGL work, uh, all of that, recognized visual and performing arts, our extracurricular offerings. We saw that this evening, our cheerleading uh, program, our athletic programs, so much to be proud of. North, And that's a lot that I believe, as somebody new coming into the school district, that we can build on for great. So really the question becomes, uh, as, as the new leader coming in, so how well are we serving or preparing all of our students? And as the new leader, it is significant to, to look at the entire system, to look at uh, students from pre-K uh, through kindergarten. So it is amazing uh, that the pre-kindergarten class, we are now serving the class of 20. 35. That's pretty amazing. So when we look at our school system, we've really got to look to the future. And as children enter our system, we wanted them to exit our system to be the absolute best that they can be. So let me begin sharing some of the of some of our data profiles. So uh, this data was pulled uh, about a month ago, but our student enrollment currently stands 7,580 students. And, and then you can see our demographic background, uh, background of our students. So we make up just about 60% African American. 26% Caucasian, 10% Latino, Asian at one, two or more races, um, American Indian, and then Pacific Islander. Uh, currently, our college-going rate, and I'm going to break this down a little bit further, is at 36.8. Uh, graduation rate at 82.5. Uh, we do have a growing English learner population, around seven, servicing population of 14% special education. Uh, We serve a lot, you can see right there, 75%, almost 75% of our entire district uh, is economically disadvantaged. Um, And uh, our per pupil expenditure, about uh, 11,000, ratio 15-2, average class size around 20, uh, about 564 teachers uh, currently, FTE, meaning full-time equivalent. And I'm going to dig into the ACT and the uh, math data here in a moment. Uh, Our college credit rate, and I have this a little bit later because I think it's interesting to break this down by student group as well, is at uh, 41.6%. Our ESSA, which is our accountability, our federal accountability rating here in Arkansas, uh, we do have a letter grade rating. And as you can see, we've got one school that A, one school that B, four schools and five, one. And uh, just about over, uh, almost over $105 million annual operating budget. So our teacher demographics of that 564. So you see, if you ec- if you racially take ethnic- ethnicity of our teaching force, you see that only 19% uh, represent our African American. Uh, Caucasian is is almost 79, almost 80%. Uh, we do not have any current Latino um, teachers uh, within our district. Less than 0.01 Asian, two or more races. So you know that's just something to point out when you. When you really, things that I look at, when you look at your, your demographics of your students, about 60% and Caucasian 24, but when you look at your, your teaching force is a little bit inverted, and one of the things you want to try to do is, is ensure that your teaching force matches so children see um, teachers like themselves uh, as we think about cultural differences and understanding. So you see in the center is ris- really how that breaks that 564 teaching force down uh, obviously, 251 of our teachers because we have lots of uh, nine elementary schools. And then you can see as uh, as I continue to learn, uh, there's a per, you know with 26 that are on provisional licenses, 66 on Act 1240 charter school waivers, ALP, 
And then we have a beginning teacher salary around 36,000 uh, currently. I know there's discussion around the state, the governor around the average teacher salary. So those are, those are some things to look at as well when we think about recruitment and retention uh, of our teaching team. So one of the things that I heard loud and clear uh, as I entered the district is about declining enrollment. So what this shows over the last uh, decade is a, a downward trend in declining enrollment. So when you look at 2010, about 8,804 students to, as I mentioned earlier, you know, 7,400. So uh, I heard that loud and clear across the community of a continual decline of enrollment. And that's something that we is alarming, uh, but something I believe that can be easily reversed over time to see that trend continue. Because we, let me go back, so because we know our, our per pupil allocation is based on our, our student enrollment. So, but I'll show some ideas or some thinking on how we can reverse that in the future. I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights, but how we've chunked the data, and I think this starts to tell our story is really we have to look at pre-K. We've gotta look at early childhood and school readiness. So I wanted to show this uh, as, and I stole this from the Sims, her data presentation to us, but I think it's important when we think about children that enter our school system in pre-K. So you can see we have to take students of poverty that are classified be level one, level two, level three. Uh, but you can see the demographic uh, background of our pre-K students. So 269 being African-American, Hispanic at 63, Caucasian, and then a totaling of 378 males versus females, um, our three-year-old program, our four-year-old program, and then those come from two-parent households, single-parent households. So what's interesting to me is to look at how many are single parents. Uh, it's 277 of our families uh, that are single parents. And I think that's, you know, as I point out some things that I'm looking at, uh, where there's our areas of opportunity that we can su support and expand uh, our community, our families, and our children. So this is just a little bit of the, the Haggerty Fall, um, and, and not to go into this, but we look at this from the phonemic awareness, right? So how are students beginning the reading process? So it is classified really into three chunks, pre-development, development, and secure. And you can see where a lot of students in the fall are at, at pre-development. And a little bit later, I'm gonna talk about the impact of COVID-19, but predominantly I'm look at, gonna look at some trend data, and then, we can, and then we're gonna come back with some data a little bit later. So you can see kind of pre-development. So you do see a little bit of movement um, from, from fall to winter. Um, and then you see some areas where, where students may not be as moving um, as, as we would like. Now with that said, I know that we've been implementing a new reading program, a new math program. Those are all positive steps uh, in the right direction as we get, begin to implement a cohesive curricular program. So in the K2, K2 the uh, NWEA, so uh, the RID, which is basically a measurement, so the NWEA is a really nationally normed, about over 11 million students across uh, the United States. So we're kind of lumped in with that. That's how they kind of get their normed numbers that you see are highlighted in red. And again, this shows by elementary school, and then it really shows by fall, by comparing this year to last year. And you can see where we're, you know, some schools are below the norm and some schools uh, are above the norm. And I continue to learn our NWEA. This is not assessment that I'm 100% familiar with yet, but certainly tells a story and certainly tells a data story. And again, this would be for, uh, for first grade, again, the norm at 141, uh, 155, and you can see as you look at a comparison of looking at school to school, those above and below the, the norm. And for second grade as well. And I'll, I'll talk about later some next steps that I believe as we're gonna dig into this data uh, more more cohesively throughout the academic year as we monitor. So ACT Aspire, uh, I believe that you all know as well as I do, uh, the assessment that does count for uh, ESSA and, and accountability. So this starts to tell our elementary reading story. And so this is a comparison by 17, 18, and 19, and then you see it by school. So you can look at each school's uh, trend data uh, in reading in elementary school and then I just want to point out, you know, not to dig into this a little bit deeply, but uh, if you look at just kind of the overall, so you can see kind of 2017, 2018, and 2019 overall students, um, you know, reading on grade level uh, 
appears on the surface uh, to be a little bit stagnant. We'd want to see trend lines over time that are moving uh, in, a, in a positive direction, but you can also see then individual school results as well. So this is elementary English with the reading, and this is ready exceeding, so kind of on grade level or above, uh, begins to also tell a story of each school's trend over time. Uh, where you do see some pockets of growth, you also see some cases uh, where there's some trending, some downward trending in some cases, uh, some upward movement, kind of bell curve-ish, if you will. So that starts to tell uh, a story as well. And this is elementary uh, reading by reading ready and exceeding as well. And again, not to belabor the point, but it does show some trending. It starts to tell the story of overall of North Little Rock, but it also starts to tell the story uh, from a new superintendent coming into the district, you know, how well are our students doing over time? So you do see some things that are alarming, certainly to me, some, some downward trends. Um, and when we look at state accountability measures, how our schools are measured and how they've been measured over time and if they're making. And then as we look at mathematics, looks a little bit different, uh, certainly a little bit higher in those areas. And again, trending in, in different schools. Uh, and certainly for lots of different reasons, uh, as we see some decline, some increase, uh, some stagnant, and there's lots of, again, unpacking as to why data is telling the story that it is. Science, which is a part of the ACT Aspire, you can see there as well, just some natural trends. Uh, you see, you know, certainly Crestwood sticks out Indian Hills and Lakewood, um, and certainly as I've been listening about those you know, three schools, and then looking at our other schools, certainly our schools that are classified under the accountability level. So that's telling me a, a different story uh, as well when we look at their trend in all of these areas. Now we'll move to middle school and sixth grade. Uh, so there's three, com really four components of that, which is English, science, reading, and mathematics. And again, shows that trend uh, in sixth grade uh, in each one of those content areas. So uh, trend in English, moving in, in a positive trend direction. There's some certainly movement. The, the one of the things, and I'm gonna talk about this later in next steps, is that what this data does not show is it doesn't show it by student group. And eventually we're gonna wanna get to showing our data by student group because that starts to tell a different story. And are we making movement among each student group? Is each student group showing growth? And I know schools are looking at that level and as we look at it in the future of how that will be presented, which will be a key component of our plan moving forward. Again, this looks at seventh grade. You see, again, English, science, reading, and mathematics trend. Eighth grade, again, English, you see relatively, in some cases in science, spot a little bit. So those are kind of things that I've been studying, I've been looking at if things are moving positively in the right direction across all content areas. As we move to ninth grade and we start looking at our high school program, again, it almost looks like a mirror image in some cases to, to middle school. You can just see that kind of naturally stick out. Uh, and the center of excellence, which I know has been new over the last few years, but does have some trend data as well as you see uh, here trending in a very positive direction from eight, 18 to 19 as an example. And we'll move on to 10th grade. Again, I think if you, if you compared that ninth grade and 10th grade into the middle school, you almost see a completely mirror image uh, as you look at the students move through our district. Again, this is reading exceeding at center of excellence, a two-year comparison. In the American uh, College Testing, which is the ACT, which is, I know, the college readiness indicator, uh, not only used for college entrance, but certainly used as part of the accountability measure as well. So this shows a five-year trend data uh, over school versus the state comparison. So you see kind of in blue, North Little Rock High School, 17-4, 17-2, 17-3, and then where the state average as well. So you can see it's, it, it seems kind of flat, it seems kind of leveled off, not necessarily showing any, any movement forward or, or decline. And then the center of excellence, Again, seems to me that 17 and 18. And again, to looking at how does North Little Rock Center of Excellence compare uh, to the state average? One of the things that we're always going to look at is, you know, how do we compare 
uh, to ourselves, but how do we compare to local school districts around us, and then how do we compare to the state? Those are things to always be mindful of to move forward. And this is college readiness. Again, North Little Rock High School, you can see a little bit of a two-year trend, but you're starting to pick up uh, as we start to look at and tell our data story. Uh, it seems a little flat over time, uh, pretty consistent in that scoring. Uh, the center of excellence, again, showing that kind of trendward up a little bit. And then, uh, so this also tells, this is a college readiness benchmark. What I wanted to highlight here, uh, as you look at this data, is what we boxed in in red. And, and it continues to tell a, a similar theme and a similar story, that, that the movement of the data seems to be leveled out. As you look at English, 38 to 39, mathematics, again, starting to pick up a trending theme in data across the district. Again, here's the center of excellence, college readiness data. I know, again, that school has been new in 17 and 18, is still developing and expanding, and what an awesome opportunity this was Nat's doing over there, those expansion programs. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, advanced placement. This is always an indicator to, to look at as how well we're preparing students. So this is over the last five years. And so, as you could see, it was in an upward trend. The total number of students, you had 397 in 2015. And and in 2019, 429, so that's positive. You know, the national data is the number of students that are in advanced placement, even though they might score a one or a two, their chances of being more successful in college. Uh, it is an indicator of that. So you see here an upward trend as well of, uh, this is very positive, advanced placement students, score of three or higher continues to increase. And then we've just added the percentage of well. And then in comparison, to also look at some trending data again, 2017 new school, but you can see how, how more students have been taking AP courses and more students scoring three or higher. That's very positive. So credit accumulation rate, uh, I always find this information, um, you know, fascinating because as students are in high school, uh, you know, having the ability to take college level courses uh, while uh, being in high school, and I know we have a great uh, partnership with Pulaski Tech. Dr. Elsby is wonderful. And um, so currently it, it stands, this is 1920 data, about 41% uh, of our overall students taking advantage of that college credit accumulation. And then as you look at that by demographic, 29%, almost 30% African American, 60% Caucasian, 20% Latino, economic disadvantaged, 28, special education at 17, uh, homeless at 20, and then gifted and talented at 60. So I look at that and see opportunity, see some advancement for opportunities of growth to expand those for students as we go forward. Uh, Mr. Jennings did a great job, all of our principals did a great job for, for that matter, uh, doing their data presentations to myself and executive team. So I did steal a couple of his, his data, data points, so I thank him for that. And, and what I just really want to point out here, and we'll dig into this as a goal later when we look at uh, discipline and safe schools, and so given the pandemic, you know, we've had, you know, fewer students actually on site. But what I want to point out <coughs> is, is the disproportionality. So when we look at the disproportionality of uh, sanctions among African-American students to their counterparts, you see, at least by what I'm looking at, more African-American males in disciplinary fractions over their counterparts. So that's something we want to look at. Uh, we also want to look at males to females. Uh, interesting, when we were looking at the data with both the middle school principals, we were, we were seeing more of a spike in females sanctions. So, you know, that starts to tell the story of where we need to focus uh, our energy and strategies. So I just wanted to show this really, and we'll dig into this more uh, as we go forward in time. And again, just to show the 10th grade, but you almost see a little bit of a mirror uh, where that's popping out. Um, and again, pointing out disproportionality. So me, it, things that I think about are what are our discipline practices, what are our policies and procedures. Um, that is really the beginning part, how that is being implemented, uh, so forth. Why are students, um, you know, what are the disciplinary infractions or sanctions? So that leads just lots of lots of questions as you keep digging into why. So we had a, uh, Dr. McGee and I, as we were uh, beginning 
the alternative learning environment. And uh, Miss Alexander has done a great job, and Miss Miller. And we were asking questions about, well, what's our data story around our alternative learning program? What's that look like, uh, as that program has to be? So I'm just going to hit some some data highlights. So as this was telling a different story to me. So as we look at our alternative learning environment, we just look at elementary school. So if you look at that trend data, one of the things obviously that sticks out are the number of African American students over Caucasian students in this data over time. And you see how enrollment has slightly uh, fluctuated, uh, but, but not too much relatively on the trend side. Uh, this tells a different story. So this tells enrollment data by grade level. And so you can see in 16 and 17, so orange represents fifth grade, fourth grade, yellow, red, second grade, and then kindergarten, which is in blue. So you can kind of see if, if you go kind of across what the trend is uh, in a particular grade level. And then what we've shared with you at the bottom is the aggregate data. So that tells you the number of students uh, that, are, that make up that data. So when you're looking at 60% or 80%, well, how, much, how many students is that? So as we look at, uh, and I, I thought this was interesting as well, uh, one of the things that Dr. McGee and I have been digging into is, so what's the criteria? How do you get into, uh, how do you get in and exit out of our alternative learning program? So you can see the, the, the kind of the big thing that sticks out here is, is disruptive behavior, um, but it also, you know, points out personal family problems, and then it kind of goes down from there. So those, again, start to glare things where you want to dig into uh, that we will dig into as a staff asking why. You know, what are the, what are the predominant areas so, and then this was interesting as well as we looked at not only the number of students entering, but the number of students exiting. So that starts to tell kind of a different story as well. And then you've got the aggregate there on the right of elementary exiting, and then the total number of students. So interesting thing that came out in our discussion is if you look in the aggregate total numbers, at, you know, it's 75, and then you see in 2020 and 2021, it seems there's pretty steady, but th the question is, are students moving out of the program? Is the program working for those students? Or once students get in the program, do we find that they're in that program for their, their educational experience? So it, it, it starts to unpack uh, a whole host of questions. This is a secondary demographic data, uh, and you can see it somewhat mirrors the elementary. So the number of our students that are enrolled in our ALE program at the secondary level uh, by student group, and you can see where that trend lies over the last five years. And again, similar to secondary, this starts to disaggregate it uh, by grade level by year. Uh, so again, you see in blue is 12th grade, 11th grade, and those, those declining numbers and decline in color as well. So you start to see kind of an 18, 19, 19, 20, like what's happening, there's, there's, there's a spike in students. And then, again, we provided for you in the public as well when we start to look at aggregate data of the number of students that are in 6, 7, 8, and 9. And one of the things that stuck out to us is, you know, it seems like when students are there in those programs that they're not um, uh, maybe as, as they could be. But there are many benefits to certainly an alternative program with a smaller environment. And, again, this is going to show the middle school program entry. Again, you see some mirroring of disruptive behaviors. You know, why is it students? And I believe it's my understanding that, you know, you have to meet multiple criteria. It's not one. Uh, again, those are questions that we begin to ask. This is the high school profile. You see it starts to look a little bit different. This is where you really start to begin to see absenteeism. If we look at, you know, the blue and the green. Those are some things that certainly stick out at me. And then you also see that, that proficiency level, language arts and mathematics, kind of mirroring some of the data that we've been looking at. Story. And again, you know, th this is important as well, and that's looking at the exit criteria. So when you look at trending-wise, um, you know, it seems to me, you know, when you look at that from, from year to year, the total number of students, 144 and 16 and 17, is that kind of trend at 220 and then... And then the graduation total. So all of this just, again, begins to, to, to tell us uh, the story, and I'll close out here with Christ's graduation. God bless you.
So our current, and this is a four year, there's a five year as well, high school graduation rate. And so all students currently stand at 82.5. And then you can see as that's broken down by student group, where I think this is, again, another area of growth and opportunity as we look at student groups and their graduation rates. Uh, then when we look at the flip side of that, is these the college going rate for all students is at 36 eight and certainly and I firmly believe that you know not every child is going to choose to go to college but we want to make sure that they have the opportunity if they choose to later uh, but there are many opportunities that you're going to see later in which you know engaging them in the world of work career and technology education and then so you can look at you can see that data as well and you can you know see when you look at that college going rate where it starts to look student group as well starts to you know begin to tell tell our story you know and that's kind of framing this as as students enter they're in our system moving to level to grade level as they exit into whatever career achieve so we all know that COVID-19 has had a significant impact uh, on student achievement and as we enter our state testing right now uh, although that's not going to be used in accountability, it is another measure to really better understand the impact of COVID-19 uh, on student achievement. So once we get that data, uh, we'll be back this summer or as soon as we get it back to do a data presentation to look at the impact. But I wanted to kind of set the frame for that next data conversation. And this is some of the research that's out of PACE in California, which also uses the MAP NWEA assessments and really just beginning the conversation uh, of you know, where is typical learning taking place, and that's why showing our data story, our, our trend data, and then the notion of learning loss and the impact of COVID-19. There's not a school district across the country in the United States that has not globally, that is not going to see a significant impact on student achievement because of, because of COVID-19. So with that, uh, the superintendent's 100-day listening and learning tour. So just to give some, some contextual background uh, information is, is one is understanding, and all of you know this 10 times better than I do, is really the organizational evolution of the North Little Rock School District over the last 10 years. And many of you have uh, witnessed, been a part of, seen different changes happen to the North Little Rock School District over time and have historical context. And you have to understand historical context to see the past in order to understand the present in order to set a direction for the, the future. And that is just acknowledging the current state that we're in, in the North Little Rock School District. So, uh, and it's my understanding, you know, that there's been three significant leadership changes at the top uh, of the organization, the top leader in the last year, uh, and four in the last seven years. And you'll see that in the data that comes out of what I've been, the impact of COVID-19. So, you know, that's just change in and of itself. Uh, now you get a new leader in November of, of 2021. So the districts has had a lot of change, throw a global pandemic on that, throw some new leadership in. And so really this was my big question. This was what I was after as I was listening to uh, community and all those stakeholders is, what do all stakeholders believe needs attention in the North Little Rock School District? So being a, a qualitative researcher, you know, when you reach data saturation and you keep listening and you, you keep hearing the same theme, pop up that, that people keep talking about must mean that, that that's something that you have to look into. Uh, so here they are. There are six key themes that have emerged uh, over my 100-day plan. Uh, number one, which is district culture, climate, environment, uh, relevant, rigorous, and innovative learning, safe, healthy, and supportive environments, organizational effectiveness, you know, how the system in itself supports the improvement of students, uh, high-quality teachers, leaders, and staff, and then how we engage and empower and inform uh, all of our stakeholders. So the first one, um, and again, and, and I preface this with, what are people talking? I'm new. I haven't even, you know, I haven't even hit six months. Um, but um, I, you know, when I was hired, and it's just who I am, I'm going to be 100% transparent all the time. And so this is a mirror of of what I've been learning and listening. So I'm going to hit some highlights. So one of the themes uh, that I've heard is that often. The, the North Little Rock School District's culture is described as to toxic or uh, and having negative perceptions, not only internally, but externally outside of our community here in North uh, 
central Arkansas, and through the state. Um, I heard the theme, you know, time and time again among disharmony uh, among school board members and, and the perception that there's been some overreaching of roles and responsibilities from the roles of board members uh, into the role of school operations or the role of the superintendent. Um, stakeholders, uh, and I always find this fascinating as well, often describe a fear of retaliation from central office leaders and school-based leaders. No one in any organization, whether you're a child, whether you're an employee, should ever feel feared of, of the people leading them or, and or the people that are there to support them. Uh, and, and that's you know, you know, one of the glaring components. Um, there, there is a belief, one of the things that emerges is a current culture uh, that places a higher value on athletic programs over academic programs. I have heard that. Um, that was shared multiple times, whether those were employees or whether they were parents. And that m leads into other conversations as well. I heard a lot about a lack of transparency, uh, whether that was in central office to schools, schools back to central office. Uh, I heard a lot about communication, whether that was internal communication, external communication, uh, central office leaders or superintendent communicating with the board, board of the superintendent, superintendent to the community, superintendent to staff, and vice versa back and, fo and so forth. Um, and, and this notion that I heard about central office plagued by personal agenda and, you know, you know people doing things for individual rather than the collective whole. Um, this stood out to me time and time again, you know, after interviewing 180 teachers. Uh, the teachers in our, our district feel that their voice is lost. And our teachers are at the heart of what we do. We're in the business of teaching and learning. And there's only one person that has the most direct impact on improving student achievement. And for our teachers to feel that their voice is not heard nor valued um, is... Is, is something, you know, as a new leader coming in, uh, again, you know, startling, but as you'll see later, all things that I believe can be changed and transformed. Uh, there is a feeling of racial and economic uh, division and tension in our school district. Uh, I've heard that from multiple employees, and that's kind of, you know, raised my attention as well. Um, folks have talked about uh, an outdated vision and mission. Um, and stakeholders feeling unclear uh, where the direction and focus is headed for the district. Um, but I will say to that, I learned that that, that phrase, world-class schools for world-class students, was coined in 1993. And as someone just entering the district, I think the district has lived up to that. We do have world-class facility schools. So the vision has, 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 has come to fruition. I think that's a, that is a positive thing. So the second theme uh, was rigorous, relevant, and innovative learning. And, and, as, and as I shared with you in our trending data, so one of the things that, that sticks out is, is either trending stagnant data, academic data, or declining data, and specifically in student achievement. Again, if we were going to unpack that with a student group, it would probably tell us a completely different story. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we do have six schools that are current below the C report card rating. Uh, I heard it a lot from lots of stakeholders, just a lack of focus on academics, a lack of focus on teaching and learning, daily rigorous instruction. Um, one of the things that I heard often was uncoordinated uh, curricular uh, programming and management from really a, a centralized level, uh, which is one of the things we talked about. And, and of that rigorous piece, one of the things that, I, that started to emerge are possible some reasons why there's declining enrollment why there's been a trend over the last decade of declining enrollment. Uh, classroom teachers feel uh, that, they're, that many initiatives are misaligned. Uh, they feel they're unclear. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's many initiatives at one time. And so, and, and I think there's all good intentions, you know, not having a reading program, not having a math program, makes sense to put them in, but from the teacher's perspective and then add on a, an elementary new grading you know, there, the, the sense is, and I think one teacher described it, Dr. P, is, you know, a hamster on a wheel. I'm just, just trying to. And um, so that's real because that's real on the individuals that we're asking to implement. And then we ask to implement, implement with fidelity. And when it doesn't happen to fidelity, we go, well, why isn't it happening? So, again, just, just sharing a bigger picture. 
I've been impressed with a focus on professional learning communities in our school. Um, that is a high leverage strategy, and there's been a, some traction here. And that's a positive thing to continue to build on. Uh, but it has been inconsistent. I have heard that from teachers, administrators, uh, lack of clarity, roles and responsibilities, and one of the things that they're asking is more development. So on the curricular side, we have multiple just, you know, we have multiple learning management systems um, for different reasons. I use the summit. I heard a lot about that. Ingenuity. I heard a lot about wit and wisdom uh, in the reading program. I heard that. I bet in all my elementary interviews, that kind of just stood up to it. So that is an area to continue to, to look at as well. So in theme three is all the safety, health, and supportive learning environment. So one of the things that, that I've learned very quickly is, is just there was a simply uh, a lack of district control and coordinated effort around school safety and security systems across the district. And so we've began to put some things in place, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that was, that was very glaring to me, hitting the ground running. Uh, I heard, if I heard it from teachers or I heard it from the community about the middle school campus, um, the middle school campus, you know, feeling outdated and just really feeling that whether I was talking to parents or whether I was talking to teachers about the sheer size. So our elementary kids, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, come out of nine elementary schools in small environments. And now they come into a, a, a bigger environment, uh, two buildings, which I, which I think is kind of interesting because it does get to small. Um, so in the kind of notion that overwhelmed by size. Um, social emotional needs, I think if, and I talked about this in my interview, that has really brought a light is social emotional needs of students, of parents, and of teachers, and I would even for, of leaders as well. Uh, COVID-19 has taken its toll on people, and people are stressed. This has been a long year, just need to get through the school year, and uh, so we need to do some work in that area. Certainly the impact of the global pandemic. Um, and Ms. Ms. Temple had mentioned this the other day when we visited transportation. I think it was one of the board meetings I heard Ms. Uh, Ms. Williams say about transportation and, and the paint. And, and I've heard that from a lot of employees. Uh, the maintenance building, the annex building, food and nutrition building. You know, when I went to work, when I went to work, I went to visit the annex and I was like, wow, we have employees that are in this building. We, we can do better. And so that kind of came to light. Um, and I think the other thing that came to light is these multiple facility projects, right? So we have Old Main, um, we have the Police and Courts building that it's, I've been referring to as this, you know, chess, uh, building chess piece match that we're going to have. So I've got some ideas. Uh, four is, is effective and sustainable organizational effectiveness. So how is it as an organization that we're working? Uh, again, the lack of consistency of leadership over the time, and, and people feel because of that, there's not only a lack of accountability, but a lack of roles and responsibilities or job responsibilities, and people aren't being held accountable to, you know, what their job is and, and doing that particular job. Uh, the assessment that I've heard is a very loose district structure on uh, its systems and structures and processes and procedures. It's, uh, it's been described as, as loose. Um, the central office organizational structure uh, appears misaligned. Uh, to meet the overall organ effect, organizational effectiveness needs of our individual schools for improvement. Uh, I know there has been, uh, Mr. Quinn, I know the Board of Contract have done some work around strategic planning, but one of the things I heard over and over was just lack of, you know, district-wide kind of short and long-term planning. Um, lose control of central office functions, and this is where we start really the coordination between major departments, human resources, budget and finance, state and federal programs, uh, and matter of fact, when we went through the new budget process, Mr. Brown did allude to that, some siloing of, of folks working in central office, kind of working in, in individually. Um, again, that kind of disconnect between schools and central office, I heard, and this came up at our board retreat, you know, just some inconsistency in, in district policy, regulations, procedures, some things outdated, some things we don't have, and then as you all know, that's the governing structure in which you make decisions and, and fall back on decisions that support you. Um, I heard this over and over again about multiple concerns about employee placement uh, on salary scales and rates of pay. Um, employees talking about not sure how this person got on that scale at that time, but I'm in the same rates of pay. It's my understanding different schools had different rates of pay for doing the same work. 
So if I was a teacher at this school, I've got a different rate of pay than a teacher. So I heard that a lot of, of the inconsistency as how we're allocating resources. Uh, we're almost through the theme. So high quality teachers are learning. Uh, one of the things I noticed very quickly and, and that was shared with me, I real, it's just a loose control of human uh, resource positions across the entire district. You know, uh, building level, what are those positions? What funding source does it come from? Uh, positions we hire, new hires, how did that, all of that. Um, stakeholders, I heard this a lot, stakeholders believe that hiring practices have been based on relationships and friends getting jobs, not over those most highly qualified for that individual job. So having the knowledge and skills, I heard that a lot. Um, perceptions, uh, heard this a lot too. There's some perceptions from our stakeholders that those in central office uh, might not have the, the requisite necessarily knowledge and skills to, to be in those the job and responsibility and how many have described that is uh, maybe a potential reason for maybe a lack of trust in central office, a lack of, of support or credibility. Um, we talked about mul uh, multi-classroom leafers or opportunity culture. I, after 180 interviews of teachers, I, I've just heard mixed reviews. I've heard some that, you know, it's working and where some would tell me, Dr. P, get rid of it tomorrow, I'm not seeing any value. So there's just some inconsistency in, in implementation. And as you know from the last presentation, it's about $2.6 million that we spend on that, uh, that initiative. Um, inconsistent professional development. Teachers want more professional development in technology. Uh, they really want more professional development in their content area. I can't tell you how many times I heard, Dr. P, who do I call for a math question? Who do I call, or I'm a high school teacher teaching you know, calculus. Who do I call in central office if I have, and I don't have that necessarily support that I could. Um, just in, inconsistency in data analysis. I think schools are doing a really good job and they're trying, they're looking at all this stuff. You know, one of the, the big ahas that we had as an executive team as we were talking with principals and their budget presentations, as we were going through all this and I asked the question, are we testing too much? And everybody just kind of nodded their head and said, I, we might be. And so we've got to start looking at, so if we're going to give the assessment, what are we going to do with it, right? We're not just giving it to give it. I mean, there's a, there's a purpose. It, it's in the teaching and learning process. If we're given a bunch of assessments, but we're not using it and, and using it to, to improve instruction. So I think that's, that's an area of growth as well. Um, many employees talked about professional development for, for, for all employees around cultural practices. That rang true by all the stakeholders that I said, Dr. P, please, we, we've got to learn more about each other and begin to unify our school district. And it starts with understanding that we're all different. We all, we all come to this work different. I heard that. So last is, is six, and again, you heard that around communication internally, externally. Uh, customer service, uh, I, whether I heard that from parents, whether I heard that from our own employees, you know, some employees feeling at some schools, I don't seem to get the level of service that my counterparts do in, in other parts. So that's something we, we need to look at and something I've been talking about around hospitality. Um, this came up from, from multiple stakeholders is the, and I, we brought this up at the retreat, I believe, is, and I've been learning about the misalignment of, you have the North Little Rock School District um, boundary zones, but then you have the North Little Rock city limits. And so I remember when my wife and I came, I'm like, oh, that's a house in, in North Little Rock. And like, nope, oh, nope, that's not. It, it is in North Little Rock, but it's not in North Little Rock. So I think that's something interesting. Um, the, this came up a lot, and this kind of ties into enrollment, just kind of the loss of students and parents to Arkansas School Choice. And parents have the choice, just like we have a choice to do anything. Go to a restaurant, parents have a choice to use any school system. So we want to be the school that they choose. Um, you know, a accountability, I heard a lot, certainly in the pandemic, about, you know, how to hold parents accountable. So I heard some of that as well. Um, this stuck out to me, too. I, I heard a lot from communities about uh, support for our Latino community, uh, support for our Hispanic community, and support for our African-American communities uh, as well, and specifically single parents. I think we saw some of that in the data from pre-K we're the largest number of students, but are coming from single family homes. So I think there's some work there. And, and, and just more parent training. I, I hear parents, you know, I want to learn more about the reading. Certainly. So 
change is coming, right? So, you know, I think all of us understand, you know, you've hired me to do a, a job. And, uh, and I take my job very seriously. And I said this to my staff on the very first day. I'm, I'm not here to make enemies. I'm not. And, and, I'm, and I'm not here to make friends. I hope we become friends because that becomes very collaborative work. But I'm here to do a job, and I'm here to, to serve as children. That's what we do in the North Little Rock School District. We serve children. And so, uh, and I've been telling staff all the time, I mean, you can't expect a new leader to come in and not start thinking about change. So I lead with that because one of my favorite authors, Dr. John Cotter, has written for decades at the Harvard Business School. Uh, he's looked at organizational change in, in many, many years. And uh, the model I'm most familiar with is Cotter's uh, eight change model. And so I'm not going to go through all this, but it is, it is a strategic process that works. And uh, having experienced with it, uh, it is a roadmap for change in the organization. And it really starts with what we're doing this evening, that first pillar, which is creating a sense of urgency. And that is the whole hope of this presentation is I hope by this presentation should move all of us as a school district that we can do better to serve all of our children. And we can do it. And we can do it only by uniting together to do it. So I use this because it's a, it's, it's a process we're going to use here. Uh, and really, it's about creating a sense of urgency, building the guiding coalition, the strategic vision, moving into strategic planning, professional development, acceleration, implementing change, monitoring that as we go forward. So with that, I just wanted to, to make a, a quick plug. Uh, as our first executive team meeting, uh, I laid out all of my expectations, but, but this was a kind of a short and sweet one to keep it simple for everybody is we do rock in North Little Rock and to, to remember that, but there are very specific things that I expect of myself and all of our employees. You know, following the chain of command directions, uh, there's been a loose structure here of not following the chain of command, and so in order to move forward, we've got to do that. You know, everybody has a supervisor. They need to follow that. We want to hear concerns, but we want to solve concerns most where they happen first. Um, we have to keep students at the center of every decision that we make. I will always make decisions or recommend decisions putting children and the whole child first, you know, transparency, communication. Uh, I'm big on know your job, do your job. Everybody in our school system uh, gets a paycheck every two weeks, and they're paid to do a job for this school district. Um, and, and confidentiality builds trust. I mean, we all know that, right? When, when somebody asks you to keep something in confidence, and it's all about building trust and building relationships. And I don't know how to do this any other way but to collaborate and work together. It's the only way you can really move an organization. So what are some of my next steps that, that I'm thinking and planning about? So number one is to implement ongoing professional development. I thought we had a great retreat, and there were some great suggestions from board members on professional development or requests to Beckett coming this evening and giving us some information. So I know we've talked about the book um, on the governance, and I'm working with ASBA to find us a consultant to start that book study. So I'm always open for ideas on, on how you, you know, want to professionally develop together and grow together, because I think that's the way. Uh, we've got some, it was requested at the board about parliamentary procedures and effective board meetings, so we're going to get some PD next week from uh, Mr. Green through ASBA, so want to continue that. Uh, conduct a central uh, office uh, organizational audit um, and really redesign it, and for maximum efficiency, performance, and support to improve schools. Uh, and I know a consultant, uh, Dr. Berger, is working on that. He'll have that presentation for you. The way coming in and looking at our organizational structure, I do not believe how we're currently structured is going to get us to where we need to be, and that's improving teaching and learning. Uh, it's my job to develop a top leadership team and develop them uh, to really focus on the performance of schools. And I've talked about this before, and I believe it again. So conducting a curriculum management audit, uh, compensation study audit, and I've done some work today with Mr. Smith. It's led me more to believe that that, that really needs to happen sooner than later. Uh, and that will just focus on all of our compensation, process procedures. I think that's going to give us some good information. School security, safety, uh, budget and finance. Uh, I believe we need a deeper dive, a deeper analysis into those departments. Um, conduct a declining enrollment audit uh, with strategies uh, to expand and strengthen 
educational options and programs for students because the way to reverse declining enrollment and increase is to build programs for kids. And I think this, this is the wave of the future for the North Little Rock School District. So, and I've just put some examples from here of, of things and I really want people to begin to think about what can be. I mean, imagine if one of our schools was a dual language immersion program and I've seen it in action and it's absolutely amazing. I mean, imagine our littlest ones learning Spanish. I mean, learning mathematics in another language. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, uh, STEAM, and we've got some great work that's happening uh, in, in STEM and STEAM, arts integration. Uh, I'm a big advocate of arts integration. Uh, that is a proven model uh, in, in school improvement. I think there's lots of partners here. I think children, everybody learns differently. So if I can demonstrate my learning through the arts, I can demonstrate that I've mastered that. I think there's great opportunity for that. Uh, we live in the natural state. I mean, why not with environmental literacy and environmental science? Uh, I also know we have this pillar of Old Main, and I know there's lots of different ideas, but I, I just want people to, to, to imagine with me for a moment if we turn that into a bunch of small schools. So imagine the old main schools of automotive engineering technologies. Dr. McGee and I were just meeting. Uh, there are businesses that are lined up to partner with. Uh, get kids with hands-on experiences and pipeline jobs. You know, many of us were listening to uh, Mayor Hartwick talk. There's lots of jobs that are here. And so we want to put our students first in line with those jobs to be right here in Little Rock. And I think there's a great opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, imagine the old main school of homeland security and global languages, right? Cybersecurity. I mean, we have two defense. We have Camp Robinson here. We have the Air Force here. I think there's great opportunities for partnership. We need cybersecurity in every part of our organization today. And, you know, nobody knows that better than Mr. Brian Staggers, which many people don't know. He holds a master's degree in cybersecurity. We're very lucky to have somebody of that talent in our, in our district. But that goes to show you that cybersecurity is, is not only in government agencies, it's, it's in all agencies. Um, and, and this is kind of one of my favorite kind of ideas I've been kicking around. And, uh, and that is kind of the Rock 657 Learning Institute. And so the vision here would be redesigning alternative learning for the North Little Rock School District. So I was kicking the idea, Rock meaning North Little Rock, six after the homage of the North Little Rock six, 57 happened in 1957. I mean, imagine redesigning public education for our kids in North Little Rock. You know, we think of virtual academy. Virtual academy is an alternative program. So that could be housed in with this as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities. There's lots of opportunity for growth and expansion of programs that's not only going to enhance our own children, but they're going to attract other families and other students um, to our school district. Again, preparing, you know, just begin to start talking about the change process with water. Uh, I believe one of the best ways to help unify our entire community is a new vision, is a new mission, is a new set of core values, right? Core values, that's how we operate as individuals within the organization. Uh, and a graduate profile. What's a graduate, what do we want a graduate of North Little Rock to look like, sound like, and feel like? And then be able to back map that down into building programs to create that right here. Uh, a strategic plan. Uh, one of the things, and I'll put that as part of my goals as well, uh, we need a strategic plan. That'll be a, a key goal. And the way that the themes have been laid out, the strategic plan will mirror those, and then we'll do metrics and we'll do strategies. Um, we have to implement intense professional development for principals, assistant principals, and teacher leaders. The way that we're going to improve instruction is to by investing in our leaders as instructional leaders. So that has to, that, that has to be up on the forefront uh, as well. But it's also, when I say teacher leaders, that's MCLs, that's others, because the, the, the one approach that works is distributed leadership and empowerment of others. Uh, I also believe I have to have intense professional development for classroom teachers. And, and I would say in three specific areas. Number one, how to unpack that content standard, break that down into knowledge and skills. Uh, how do I write a classroom objective? I'm not seeing a lot of evidence doing walkthroughs of objectives being posted and how that's aligned. So that's why I believe we're getting some of the results is there's some misalignment um, uh, to the standard and, and higher level questioning. I mean, those are three key things to focus on of high leverage strategies that I believe will begin to work as we move forward. Uh, 
I also believe this is gonna make one of the most significant differences if there's anything that we can do to support classroom teachers, but um, I will recommend we allocate seven full-time equivalent positions that are dedicated experts in the field of curriculum instruction in the following content areas. So a content supervisor and early learning and school readiness, right? So an expert that's looking at everything that's happening in pre-K, K, one and two, we have to have somebody at the central office level coordinating uh, literacy. Uh, three through 12. That is going to make a huge significant, looking at interventions, looking at the program implementation. I mean, again, it's back to when I'm listening to teachers saying, who do I call in central office to, uh, and both of our executive leaders have lots of responsibility. They have supervision of principals, they have curriculum, they have assessments. That's a lot for one individual to handle. So mathematics, science, environmental literacy, social studies, visual and performing arts, uh, college and career readiness and technical education. If we're going to advance programs, that are going to enhance hands-on opportunities for students, uh, I believe this is a good investment because it's going to directly support classroom teachers. And I'll talk about that as I talk to uh, Mr. Brown. I believe we can, we can make that happen with ESSER II funds uh, and then be able to work on that. We can talk about that later. I'll come back and present the plan at another time. But it's just an idea of, of thinking about some next steps. We've got to ramp up professional development for all of our employees around cultural proficiency and then in meaningful work around it. Uh, we've got to redesign our school improvement processes. Uh, I've, I've analyzed every one of our school improvement plans. I think that's an area of opportunity for, for growth uh, for our leaders and align that with where we're headed. Uh, I believe we've got to put some protocols in place in which we're unpacking data that is so specific that tells us about the student group. So we can work on that. Uh, we've got to look at how we're using instructional time in our schools. Uh, I know the pandemic, we've had different models with that. We have to look at how we're using instructional time pre-K through 12. And, and, and the question that we need to ask is, are we getting the most effective and efficiency out of those current models to deliver high quality instruction? I also believe with ESSER, you know we're all getting ready to um, have summer programs, some of our, our first summer programs that we've ever had as I was talking to Dr. McGee and I were talking to principals, like, we haven't had a summer program, right? So that's going to help us with learning loss. But we also have to extend that further to offering extended day programs at every one of our elementary schools. So if we can put more kids and extended time with teachers to get them caught up, I think that will move us in the right direction. We've got to create a differentiated support plan for all of our schools that have a school rating below a C. Uh, those schools have different needs. And the needs have to be differentiated to meet those individual communities. Uh, I'm not a one-size-fits-all person. I don't think there's, there's a way that I believe in some systemic things, but I believe that each school has a different need. And um, implement a school-based budgeting process for principals to communicate their needs. Uh, we've already worked on this. Uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Smith have done a great job of putting a new uh, process in place for principals and we did that uh, in March we had budget week where so we've already started this principals came in each principal presented their data and they presented their needs principals have to be able to come and say this is what I need for my school and our job is to figure out to remove the barriers to get them those resources um, we talked about district policy and regulation at our uh, retreat uh, we'll do some work in that area. Develop a five-year technology plan. Mr. Staggers has already begun that process. I, if, if I heard it a million times from teachers saying, I forget who was with me. Yes, and we were in, I think we were at Amboy, Amboy. and we were talking to the teacher, and, and she was just standing there while it was spinning. Yeah. And, and we're like, how often does this happen? And she's like, more than you would. And I, she would. And, and so the notion there is we're losing instructional time. So we're going to ramp that up with new technology for our teachers and a, a five-year plan. I'm very proud about that. Uh, we have to analyze our building uh, projects with the top priority of the middle school. Uh, when we come to that middle school project, and I'll just say it publicly, I will advocate. Uh, my recommendation is that we, we build a, a brand new middle, middle school. And we look at how to make that middle school feel small in smaller learning communities. So. We're going to be working on some stuff, Mr. Hatch and Mr. Brown. We're going to come with a slate of priorities, but that will be my priority um, to, to tackle a new middle school project. And implementing engaging strategies with our community, improve communication. I think, Mr. Barnes, we've been doing some things to try to reach out to our community, improve communication between the board and the superintendent. 
Uh, and last, my goal is to present, based upon all of this, is to present my 2021, 2022 uh, goals, superintendent goals to you next month. Um, now that we've kind of know a little bit of the process, I've been working on that with uh, Mr. Beckett, and then uh, that will have a self-evaluation tool. Uh, so to show the public and to show you um, the accountability I'm holding of myself and that I expect to be held accountable to. So I'll be anxious when I get that done after this, then give it to the board ahead of time for feedback, and then I'll present that to you, and then you can give me that feedback, and then we can then finalize and approve those goals that you want me to work on based upon all this, and then uh, we'll move forward with, I think the clarity we got this evening was great even for me, like, okay, we know we got to get that done in December, so we seem to be on track. Let's get these goals done next month, and then we'll have some time to be able to evaluate evidence. And last, I just I somewhat lead it with this, is that uh, of all the things that, that I've shared with you and that I've learned in just under six, six months, there's nothing here that we can't change. There's nothing here that stands in the way that can't be improved. And there's nothing here that, that should stop us from transforming our organization to what we all believe that it is. But it's going to take some time. And it's going to take consistent leadership over time. And I'm committed to do that. And as you can see, if we look at phases of what it's going to take, if we, we think about that, that young preschool student that we now begin serving the graduating class of 2035, we have an opportunity to really redesign the school district together and, and make a big difference as of every single child that we serve. And with that, you just can't hide that charging wildcat pride. So with that, I'm happy to entertain questions. Well, I have a few questions. One, thank you for that presentation. Yes, sir. Um, I, I want to start by thanking Dr. McGee for, for his involvement and support. I know you guys have been working very hard yes, to pull all of this together. But I also want to thank you for not bringing us a filtered presentation. <laughs> uh, I think it was very real. I can tell by the information that you presented to us that, that you didn't put anything in the drawer and say, oh, no, we can't put that out there. So I know that that was unfiltered and real, and I think that's what we need uh, if we're going to be able to move forward. I so I just kind of want to be. Is Dr. McGee here? I didn't. He, he is, yeah. <laughs> he he I know he had a family engagement, but he, he needs to be sitting here with us. Come on up, Dr. McGee. I know he didn't know he snuck in him. <laughs> but I want to be kind of as candid as you have been, you and Dr. McGee, about kind of what I'm seeing. I mean, as I have excitement about some of those things that uh, you have mentioned. Thanks so much for even recognizing the North Little Rock Six uh, and the contributions that they made. I want you to meet one of them yes. uh, as well. But one of the problems that I have seen in the past is, one, um, there's been several superintendents that I have seen, either from being on this board or even before I was on this board and trying to support Ms. Williams and others on this board when I was in the legislature, that there's not a lot of superintendents that have survived too far beyond this point <laughs> of identifying the issues coming up with a strategic plan. And the reason I say that, because the next step then is making tough decisions mm -hmm. and ruffling feathers. Yes, sir. And I mean, ruffle feathers, people call people, and they call their school board members or other people and say, hey, this, this is not right. So when the implementation phase comes for this, I want you to be ready because the honeymoon will be officially over. Well, I, uh, I want you to answer that, and I have one more follow-up. Sure. Well, well, thank you for that, and and you know, in my and thank you for that, you know, perspective of uh, maybe some of my predecessors that haven't maybe gotten beyond. Uh, and again, I and I don't know all the back the back history. Um, and and I think, as I was reflecting on, you know, the hard decisions. Uh, you're absolutely right. That's what I get paid to do. That's what you've all paid me to do. There's going to be some difficult decisions to make. And when you start thinking about people and the relationships that they have, 
we, we have to be centered on why we're here. We're here to serve as children, bottom line. And I will always be someone that will be upfront. I will always be honest. I will always be showing you the why. But it's clear to me that after all the data that we've looked at, how we're currently operating isn't how, it isn't currently getting us, I think, where we want to get to. So uh, I, I do expect that, Mr. Steele. I, I expect the phone calls. I expect employee phone calls to board members and, and, and all of that. But I think, I think it comes back to an entire belief. Do we all believe on that we can be the absolute best school system? And I, and I think if our compass is around, as I mentioned, those superintendent's decisions, if we make decisions that are in the best interest of all students, we base our decisions based on data. We base our decisions on policy. We base our decisions on regulation. Those, those are the things that, that hold uh, strong decision making. Let's face it, when, when you have to make difficult decisions, not everybody's gonna like your decision. That's just part of change. That's just part of leadership. And some people aren't gonna like some of the changes that I'm gonna have to make. That's, that's true. And I think the more we can talk about the change process, but a, as I mentioned before, um, I'm not here to make enemies. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to do a job as children. And I, and I hope we develop friends. I mean, that's, that, that creates a great environment. And I do want to say before I let Dr. McGee, and I didn't realize he came in, um, what a tremendous asset this school system has. And Dr. McGee is our assistant superintendent. I couldn't have stepped into this role as I did without the support of this, this, this leader. And, and what we've been working hard to do is work together and model what collaboration teamwork uh, looks like, sounds like, and feels like. And I, I, I appreciate him, and I have the utmost respect for him, and I'm glad we're colleagues. Great, great. Just a quick, quick follow-up. Um, I certainly believe a board operates best and can come together most effectively when they support the vision of the superintendent, the CEO, the president, sure. whatever the case may yes, be, sir. because it shouldn't be multiple visions. It's, it's going to have to be one vision. That's right. And I think the other major challenge that you are, you are going to have is being able to be focused. You can't be, once you do that, and I know your background and your education is going to bring us some very specific goals. The key is staying on track with those goals. And those who have really been involved with this district, they, they, they've heard it before. They, they've heard that song. I see Crystal back there, Leanne. They've been around long enough to know exactly what happens. And what happens is, you get pulled away. You as superintendent, assistant superintendent, you guys get pulled away from those investigations, from employees making irresponsible bad decisions. Dealing with those type of issues can really sidetrack you because what you've got in front of you is a tremendous plan, but it's going to take all you have and all we have to stay this focus long enough so that we can see some successes and I think it's going to be critically important that we focus and drill down on those things that we can measure I think that's going to be very critical as for example no Hispanic teachers we can measure that we can make that that's a priority a, that, that, that's exactly right and, and yeah. I think when you see the development of the strategic plan that we'll put forward it's going to have those metrics because that's what holds us accountable and, and I agree with you. That's got to be an area of, of target. Um, so, yes, I, I, I understand where you – and, you know, this – I think listening to you and, and certainly what we've presented, uh, there's a lot of work to do here. Uh, but we're committed to it. And I expect to be held accountable. And, and you will see in my goals how I'm going to self-assess myself. And that's what I expect of the board is to uh, – I expect to be held accountable. And I expect all my staff to be held accountable because the bottom line is, Mr. Steele, the superintendent is one person. It takes everybody to work together to move our school. And that's why it, you know, it takes distributed leadership. It takes our community partners. It, it takes all of that. But I respect your comments and 
I appreciate you. truly one district. We do rock. But rock one district. Every district. We do our best knowledge. We have best respect for we expect. That's where we're gonna feel our First, I want to commend you, Tim Brooks. But it's always been said, I wish I could sing that song that the girl had that better together <laughs> on Channel 7. But I personally like to say, for everything for 100 days, I have to give it up. You tell it, the communication has been phenomenal. You have told us everything except when you have personal things. <laughs> <laughs> but you have communicated. And with us letting us know, he was out to be at the jury, around the schedule, everything. But what I feel as a board perhaps be a resolution that will support everything that we're trying to do mm -hmm. as one as one it's there you told the truth about everything you heard yes ma'am and it was the truth and now all we have to do is to work together to make north rock the best yes. district yes. in the whole united states yes ma'am. and it's possible we got good people we got great people good at cabinet manner members and i like the point where you say it important in the board but word kept making people do their job is simply making them accountable for That's what right. they need to do and i appreciate you and when one is not here dr mcgee has stood in the gap yes. and it's teamwork it is and when everybody if the finance listens to the, uh to the federal and if the federal will listen, the things that you're trying to tell us, if we would just do it. I have and board members and to you have people out there. I certainly want to say I have been bored on the board <laughs> because you have been doing your job. I'll put it like that. And I appreciate you very much. And I hope that we as board members come together with them, whatever the cabinet members come up with. That we support it. It's time to move forward. Yes, ma'am. Forward. And I thank all of you for sitting out there. You're doing your job. I thank you. I appreciate it. every week. I know you're doing some work. <laughs> Our pay is not just flip flop. And, and that's all I want to say. I want to commend all of you all for working together. As I said, board. And I'm glad I'm board. <laughs> Don't have to worry about anything. Thank you. I just want to thank you. And that resolution, how do we get that support that heard so we can go forward? So we've heard what we said you want to do. Now it's up to the board to support you and what you are trying. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say real quick, thank you so much for that thorough presentation mm -hmm. but it's just going back to what you know i've mentioned to you before about drum line it has to be one band one sound yes, from there you get a melodious sound and you can simply play it in your sleep so that's all i want to say yeah. <laughs> anybody else That require doesn't require a vote. No, it's, it's, it's oh, just informational, Mr. Thank you for that presentation. And I will say this is more data than I've seen in a 
almost four years on the board. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let us eyes on each other. Work. No, it's our job to pull our eyes on each other. Madam Chair, are, are we ready for first act? Madam Chair, um, I move that. We approve the disposition of minutes of meetings, regular board meeting minutes, uh, March 18th, and special board meeting minutes, April. Moved and published. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, Madam Chairperson, I uh, make a motion that we go ahead and accept uh, line item. Second. Yes, Move and proper. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone? Motion. Yes, ma'am. Consent agenda item 8.3, 8.3A, 8.3B, and 8.3C, uh, the monthly financial report. This has a bank reconciliation uh, due to an employee that, that no longer works with us. 8.03 are business items. Uh, temperature screenings, which will take place at all of our schools. Cooling towers at North Little Rock High School. Um, the sprinkler and fire alarm system monitoring, which will be at all schools. Um, and the Z space, which is pretty cool, has COVID-19 for our CTE programs that allows a virtual program allows them to work hands-on. Cool. And so those would be the items for your consideration consent agenda. Madam President, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Okay. Moved and properly second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, item Action item 8.4, 2001-2002 statement of uh, IDEA Part B, 611-610 funds for the provision of special education. Related as it was. Adam. I said. Thank you. Maybe in proper second. Aye. Aye. Anyone? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, action item 8.5 our arch four day treatment MOU as presented at our last. Madam Chair, move the re a quick forward Second. Move and proper second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion. Thank you. Uh, the last item, which is 8.6, North Little Rock Middle School sixth grade cell phone pole replacement, uh, as presented by Mr. Brown in our last question. Clarify the safety of our children during this. Move the mask. Okay. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, Verizon has committed. I've spoken with uh, their personnel. Uh, they've committed to um, conducting their work during times when school is not session. We've discussed with them our summer school plans, the date schedules. Uh, if their goal was to shoot for the two weeks, uh, period between the time regular school ends and summer school begins. But uh, I think the permit process may be challenging there, so they've committed if they can't get the work done in that two-week window, they would conduct it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday when summer, when school So, yes, they will do the work when, when the students are not. Are you up? Wow. Tell us 
bad for you today. Please stop recording the conversation. Get mad. Um, May 18th. May 18th, yes, yes. sir. Um, yes, ma'am. We have, um, we have reserved Barton Coliseum. We've been working with the high school on getting their stage rentals. Uh, we've worked on that contract this week. Um, so uh, as far as I know, I'll be, all of that what's is the, on what's the schedule. Protocol? What's the protocol? As far as cleaning? I think we're still working with Barton on that. They've. Um, you know, they had protocols in place prior, we knew them prior to um, the governor's uh, new stance on that and the CDC's new stance on social distancing. So um, I'm sure we'll get more communication. We'll, uh, I, I think we'll operate within the parameters that Barton allows us yes. to do. So. Uh, Yes, we'll, and we'll make sure we get a communication out to you, Dr. Reyes. I mean, I think that's a really good point. As things have changed, we'll make sure our community, I know through our Mr. Barnes's newsletter, we, we did put out the dates. I don't think, Mr. Barnes, there was anything specifically on guidelines for that one, but we will. We'll make sure that we do that. And that's a good suggestion. Yeah, on the ground that the minutes are magic. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Need a motion. Madam President, yes. I so move. Moved and properly second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. The next board work uh, graduation on May May 18th. Madam President, I'd like to have a point of personal privilege. Uh, former coach Dwight Lofton uh, taught here in the Little North Rock School District for many years. Junior high school coach and a civics teacher. Uh, he went on to uh, be a very successful coach at Forest City. Uh, Crystal, I think your old neighbor. Um, he passed, suddenly passed away recently, and uh, would just like to acknowledge him as an outstanding former employee of the North Little Rock School District. Thank you. Oh, and my brother, Mr. Time their employees or students pass away. We as a board have have a letter square. Our building. I would like to sign. And that we have a lady who was second year. That's for the district. A letter should go out. So I had it maybe that John, this is no. I just wanted to ask you if you could put that in a motion, ma'am. Okay, since I'm parliamentarian, I well, just to many may not know that other than. Every district passing that Dustin sends to me, I do send a note. A notice. I okay. send them an email. Every one that Dustin sends to me, because if I can't find the person, he hears from me because I need to find the person. All he has to do is so I have been sending. Family. Mr. Superintendent, could you can you help facilitate that? Absolutely. I don't want to just put it out there and it's not. Sure. We yes. Can, we can get. Madam President, I will make a motion that the North Rock School District send a letter 
some recognition for any past employee, board member, anyone that's officially re related to the North Horizon School District. Mm -hmm. Any purpose second? All in favor? Ah. Uh, Opposed? Uh, yes, uh, but it'll be prior to the 27th. So uh, Dr. McGee and I are working on a virtual learning 2.0 program. So we will let you know uh, more than likely, not next week, but the week before, just so we can get some feedback, then approve it, and then we have to upload it to May 1st to ADE, Dr. McGee. And so that would give us some time. But there are some things we just wanted to make sure that we were clear to our public about what the programs look like. But we will offer. A virtual learning program. I think that's a it's an exciting opportunity, not necessarily for every child, uh, sure. but uh, it it is for some. I want to make sure that we offer that, and I think that's going to help with student enrollment as well as we continue. So, Dr. McGee has been leading, doing an excellent job on that. We'll bring that forward to you at that special meeting. Yeah, you already have. A, I'm sorry. You already have a date. Well, we. I think we were thinking May the 27th, and I believe I, April. April 26th or the Tuesday 27th. Okay, either one of those days. So we, matter of fact, we're going to make that decision, I think, tomorrow after Correct. we meet, and then we'll, we'll let the board know so you know in advance. But that would just be a special meeting, and I'd, we have to have that at 530? Yeah. No, okay. Well, we could do a noon if you know, my understanding, we could do a noon before. No, 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 no. But if there's personnel, we'd have to do it by 5.30, gotcha. correct. And also, okay. Superintendent, let me correct that it has to be uploaded by April 30th. May 1st okay. is on a Saturday. So today, Desi did spoke with ADE, got until Friday, April okay. 30th. Okay, so definitely it'll be Monday or Tuesday. Correct. Thank you, Doc. Oh, <laughs> um, I had just had a quick question. Prom, I mean, yeah, prom. In effect, no. they they they're speaking with Mr. Jennings. They're doing a senior night week, going to replace. But it's like a senior recognition. Uh, where they'll be able to bring somebody, uh, but it's not prom. As they're okay. kind of trying to blend, I think. Given given. Okay, thank. You. Yes, ma'am. Madam President, I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.